in this episode of The Tripod. We've said it a lot, yeah. It's like you, you learn by doing. Do you know yeah, I, mean? I think so. And not yeah. being yeah. afraid and to get it wrong. 100%. Make the mistakes. Absolutely. And mm. it, it's actually good to look back at those old images to try <laughs> give you a bit of a reminder of hopefully how far you've come and where you've learned, you know. Oh, God, yes. I've made my Flickr account private. <laughs> <laughs> I should do the same, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that, that, yeah. No, that's a good idea. Welcome to the tripod. Our guest today is a photographer who in 2016 was named one of the best outdoor photographers working in the UK today by Outdoor Photography Magazine. She won Black and White Photographer of the Year in 2018 and was awarded Landscape Photographer of the Year by the Sunday Times Magazine in 2016. Her sirens portfolio is known worldwide as featuring some of the most extraordinary photos of monstrous waves captured on the south coast of England. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rachel Talibart. Rachel, how are we doing? I'm good, Yay. thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me on the show. Oh, thank you for coming on. Um, as I said before, we, I've been terribly excited about this about this interview. I'm a massive fan of your work. Um, you're one of the few photographers that, I, I live near the mountains, you're one of the few photographers that make me want to go and live by the coast. <laughs> you know, and that's not an easy feat, because so, I, I love my mountains. So um, yeah, look, thanks very much. How, how have you been doing? Yeah, not bad, thank you. Yeah, it's a bit, bit of a quiet one because... Um, I'm a, a seascape photographer who doesn't actually live by the sea, so um, <laughs> okay, lockdown nice. is uh, lockdown is definitely messing with me because I haven't seen the sea in far too long. That must be tough for someone like yeah. of your caliber who, uh, like, so I know I've listened to you for a long time. You say you spend hours just looking at the sea. I do. do I miss know? it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, Kevin, that's sad. Kevin, Kevin's yeah. like that with concerts. He, he nearly starts crying every time we mention a concert. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Well, I mean, it's it's worse for you because I mean, you can't have have there been any concerts since March last year. Uh, no, the last gig I had was uh, the like 21st of February last year. So wow. Crikey. That's it's okay. Time. It's, it's, it's I just I'm just afraid I'll forget how to do it when it comes back yeah. around. Yeah, be like riding a bike. Yeah, that's definitely. It. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Um, I, I had that fear with weddings as well. And then when I finally got to go back after the first lockdown and do a wedding, like on the morning, the anxiety, but it, it does just oh, flow yeah. back to you. But the, on the morning, I was like, I need my 17th coffee. And it was only 7 a.m. <laughs> trying to calm the nerves. <laughs> You're worse than me. I thought I was bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tip of the um, iceberg. We'll yeah, get into it. <laughs> I mean... We we uh, we often discuss the podcast, Rachel, how we've kind of been keeping ourselves busy. And um, I remember watching uh, your interview on on Sean Tucker, the piece you did with Sean, and uh, you had fifteen SD cards lined up on your desk, ready to uh, process <laughs> photographs. So I'm sure you've been able to keep busy, have you, over the last couple of months? Um, yeah, I've I've still got I've still got a few. Oh wow! Sitting here, <laughs> I've got only two, oh, only that's two. Not, <laughs> that's not that's not bad going. It well, gave no. me anxiety when I saw this. SD cards lined up <laughs> beside the <bottom. laughs> ready to go. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely been an advantage. It's given me something to do, which is nice. Hundred um, percent. But yeah, um, no, I just I well, if you watch Sean's video, you'll know I I just have to work that way. I have mm. to have a big gap, big gap between being out in the sea and getting very excited and reviewing the pictures. It I'm having so a very sense. big gap at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're, you're really taking that to the ultimate. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I wish I could say it was self-inflicted. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it makes sense. I mean, we've often talked about it as well, like how kind of coming back to images with fresh eyes, you realise so many things that you could have possibly done wrong or done better. And even when you're processing, it's, it's very important to come back to an image with fresh eyes, you know. So it makes sense. I think like, so. Yeah, mm. yeah, hundred percent. It's an interesting way to work. Um, I'd like to say I do that, but uh, sometimes when I come home, I'm so excited. I give it a day, but no more than a day. I think <laughs> the the photos are, are on the computer then, and we're having a look. But um, yeah, but you know, some people don't just are creative in a different way. So when I was doing that video with Sean, he told me that he has to be have a much quicker flow through. You know, he'll capture a picture, he'll edit it, and he'll publish it in the same day. And that's what keeps him creative. So, mm. I mean, you, you guys me. doing weddings and gigs must have to have a much faster workflow than me and Sean. Mm. Yeah, my gigs, generally speaking, I have 48 hour turnaround. So, which yeah. isn't, like, it's not too bad, but I would like tend to or want to release at least one image within mm. 
two hours of getting home. So I'll, you know, sit, sit yeah. up, pick one. That's because you're lined to, up with 10 other photographers and you're all competing, aren't you, to get out that first yes. shot? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That is yeah, exactly yeah. it. It's whoever gets the first one out gets basically the most exposure out of it. So yeah, it's nice. the way of the world. It's mad. It I is. actually had a, um, I had a great tip from a wedding photographer that I was learning with. And he said, you should have a self-imposed deadline of like 48 or 72 hours to have like a preview say um client gallery ready to deliver and by doing that you make all your mistakes in the first 48 hours and then when you deliver the product and your client reviews it you're like right okay i need to do this this and this and the double whammy then is when you actually go back and realize your mistakes you process it up deliver it to the clients and then they're even happier because they saw how terrible you did the first time yeah. so it works out really well <laughs> that's, that, that's quite a scary like that. tactic i'd imagine that's one way to do it um rachel take us back to um your, you mentioned you often mention your love of the ocean. Um, even though you might not be the best, you might not have the greatest sea legs. I've heard you say it before. I'm the exact same. I'm a very oh, bad, yeah. very bad traveller, and I'm I, I fish as well. So when I'm on the boat, it's just it's 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 it's, it's carnage. But um, was photography always interlinked with your love of the ocean from from a very young age? Um, no, the two were were quite separate actually. Um, honestly, I'll be, I'll be, I'll ruin the romance of it now. But, um, <sighs> when I was doing all that sailing, when I was a child, I didn't like it at all. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, kids want to, want to be free, don't they? To run. Yeah. And I mean, I, I was a, a bit of a bookworm, so it wasn't so bad for me, but my younger brother was always a, you know, very sporty, physical kind of boy and having to sit in the cockpit of a boat for hours on end while you cross the channel, which took a lot longer in those days. Mm. I think it was quite hard. And, um, you know, we certainly had lots of uh, great adventures, but on the whole, I, I just wanted it to be over. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Peace> so, <laughs> um, but I, I think while I don't like sailing and I really don't, I'm not going back to it ever. Um, I guess the ocean did sort of as a back backdrop to my whole childhood, did come to mean quite a lot to me and, and even after dad stopped sailing we lived um less than 100 yards from the beach so you know beautiful any sort of teenage moments you know i could go and down and sulk watching the waves or whatever yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. um yeah and, and every summer you know i'd get home from my holiday jobs and just go straight down to the beach with my dog and just hang out and swim and swim and enjoy it so Amazing. But um, photography came later, came in my teens, really. And then um, it wasn't really until the last 10 to 12 years that I brought photography and the ocean together, actually. Okay. But before that, I was really, I think, well, you'd say a happy snapper, you know, a, yeah. a hobbyist, but probably not even a hugely good or you know serious hobbyist. You know, I'd go on holiday. I used to travel a lot with my backpack around the world backpacking and things and photograph what I saw and those pictures are dreadful <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, not showing them to those. anybody we all have those. that's fine I think yeah. we all started out like that I mean a happy like you you just you grab a camera and you photograph everything you can see because you just enjoy taking yeah. pictures you know, maybe that's over. kind of an important stage actually on a sort of serious note I, I don't think you I'm always slightly nervous when people tell me that they get in touch I mean people get in touch with me a lot as I'm sure they do with you guys to ask for advice and things mm. and when they tell me you know I've been take I've been doing photography for three months and I need to find a direction I've got alarm bells ringing yeah you know yeah I yeah. think they're putting the cart before the horse really do you think that's Absolutely. because um of probably social media and kind of how big photography has gone now that they're kind of they're seeing these photographers and they okay I need to start figuring out what I want to shoot in order to get better yeah, and and I don't um, in any way sort of disrespect someone's desire to get better at a thing. I think that's great. Mm. But um, I also think you have to make a lot of mistakes and experiment and, and kind of learn for yourself rather than trying to jump over that and get there too quickly. You know, a lot of um, people I know spend a huge amount of time watching YouTube videos. Um, I'm not in any way dismissing the value of the good quality ones there's a lot out there but you know the good ones are really great yeah i mean sean is a good example i you know if i watch youtube 
which I hardly ever do. But if I do, it's probably going to be someone like Sean. Exactly. Um, yeah. But, you know, they're watching so much. I sort of feel like if they spent 50% of the time they were spending watching YouTube actually outside with their camera, they'd be doing a lot better. Absolutely. That's so Absolutely true. agree with that. Mm. Absolutely. We've said it a lot. Yeah. It's like you, you learn by doing. Do you know yeah, I, mean? I think so. And not yeah. being yeah. afraid and to get it wrong. 100% make the mistakes Absolutely. and it's, mm. it's, it's actually good to look back at those old images to try <laughs> give you a bit of a reminder of hopefully how far you've come and where you've learned you know oh god yes I've made my Flickr account private <laughs> <laughs> I should do the same actually yeah, yeah, that's that 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 yet. no that's a good idea take five guys take five let's I go to Flickr and have the old images off my Instagram and I kind of think you know oh maybe I should <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's brilliant that is that's is hilarious um you mentioned uh backpacking around the world i imagine that must have broadened the mind that must have been a fantastic experience oh yeah, alone. yeah. regardless of photography or not just even being able to see the world like that oh definitely um i mean you know now i look back on it it was such a free and easy time and um i was very brave i think um in, in my early 20s just heading off on my own with a backpack um, I'm yeah. not sure I would be that brave now even. I think you'd lose that maybe as you start to become aware of your own frailty. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it was huge. I had a, some amazing experiences. I saw some incredibly uh, beautiful places and um, was confronted with some very different ways of life, some very different cultures, which mm. I think, um, well, I'm nervous about telling people that, they should be all doing that now because the world's very different now from how it was then. It is, um, yeah. mm. But I think it makes you humble, actually, when yeah. you realize just um, how other people live and how very different it is, but equally valid as a way of life. And of course, also how, how much you have, how privileged we are compared with so many people. That's it. It gives yeah, you a new perspective on that. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And like, Rachel, you actually come from kind of a different walk of life in a way and um, you have a background in law and teaching yes. law so I suppose much like myself you're a full-time photographer now I actually decided when I got married last year that I was just going to quit the rat race and um, I went full-time into photography not quite as successful as you've been Rachel <laughs> but I suppose have you any um, tips on how someone could turn their passion into a profession like your work siren went for want of a better word viral all over the world and it's just absolutely phenomenal like is that was there much in build up to that to turn your passion into a profession it was very slow actually i mean i i i didn't one day go from being 100 percent amateur to 100 percent professional um yeah. i don't know if that i think it'd be amazing i'm sure there are some people out there who've done that but it, I think that would be an incredible achievement if you could. But for me, it was very gradual over years. So, you know, balancing photography with everything else in my life, like raising my kids, mm. going back to university, all sorts of other things that I did at the same time. And just photography, just very naturally and gradually just started to, to slowly build. Um, so when I had, I talked in other interviews about this sort of epiphany moment I had back in 2015 when I decided to go full time but I was definitely already semi-professional by then it wasn't like I suddenly went boom that's it yesterday I was a lawyer today I'm a, a photographer um, and then I did get really lucky though because Sirens was less than a year later um, so sometimes you just have to be have to be lucky I guess but no I, I I, I think the trouble is that I've, I've got a few friends, one comes to mind in particular, who made that decision to just one day just give up a, a very successful day job in the city to become a full-time professional photographer. And a year and a half later, that person was back in the day job in the city. Really? Um, yeah. You know, it's it's and that's just tough on anyone's psyche, isn't it? To, yeah. You know, to have yeah. the courage to take such a, a bold leap and well, then be back to I'm not going to say back to square one but it's just like to knock someone down like that again that yeah it is it's very tough and the, like that's the thing it is a tough leap to take I think that's why a lot of people don't do it because you're leaving a very secure mm. financial job 
um, to go and pursue a not so certain career. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, regardless of like, obviously we know how talented you are and like it's a testament to you. It's not just, like you mentioned luck there, Rich. it's not just luck. It's a testament to your talent and your work ethic that you got to where you are today. But some people, unfortunately, it just doesn't work out, you know, and it, it can be a tough leap to take. So I've great yeah, admiration for people who do it, like, you know, um, but it, it, it's, it's good advice that you know, don't quit your day job and to suddenly drop everything if you're not in a position to do so, probably. Well, the trouble is, I mean, it depends what, <laughs> what sort of photographer you want to be as well. I mean, if, yes. if you're the sort of person who thrives on, on variety and, um, you know, you want to do weddings, you want to do events, you want to do landscapes, you want to do, you know, all sorts, then maybe this isn't such an issue. But if you want to specialise... And you just suddenly go from having a day job to having just photography. You're going to end up compromising on the thing that you wanted to do because you've got to got to earn some money. And you might actually end up having less time for the photography that you really love yes. than you had when you were doing it around your day job. That's so true. Yeah, I didn't mm. even think of that yeah. because of the whole admin side of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And just having to do everything because... When you first start out, the money doesn't come in, doesn't come in on yeah. its own. Yeah. That's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting point. It's almost like the the fun, passionate hobby you had could turn into a, a source of stress in your life. You mm. know, that, that could be a real flip of the coin. Well, imagine so, uh, if you had decided to become a professional because you absolutely loved Astro, for example. Yeah. And then you're just so desperate <laughs> to feed the family and pay the rent that you're doing uh balls and well in the days when we used to have balls and other events and you know 18th birthday parties and things every night yeah. and uh, yeah. you're too you're too absolutely dare I use a rude word on this knackered you're too knackered then to go out and do astro as well I mean that that would be sad wouldn't it and especially That's in Ireland, it. where it's cloudy, probably three hundred and fifty-four days of the year at night time, <laughs> where you can't see the stars. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. Um, you're like I always thought, I've, I've, I've done a, I've done a couple of well. weddings. We're all talking at once. <laughs> sorry, okay. don't stop fighting now, lads. Okay. <laughs> no, just like, I've done a couple of weddings, but like that, that, that wouldn't be my forte. And I, I, fa- I found editing a wedding feels like work you know it feels like it's, it's a la- it's a labor thing to do whereas if i'm editing a concert shot or you know if i'm editing a gig like i'm fully involved fully engrossed so i mean if you know if you leave to become a full-time photographer in one field and you end up doing others to pay the bills i could i could see how that would kind of definitely grind people down maybe mm. Mm. yeah it's an interesting one it's an interesting one mm. um your science portfolio though is 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 phenomenal rachel um, Kevin, Kevin, you worry. Yeah, Rachel, can today. I ask you there like, about the, the the composition side of things? Because obviously, I'm still trying to like branch out into the landscape side of things. And you know, I was actually I was down by the beach yesterday, and the waves were crashing against the rocks. And I was like, we have Rachel on tomorrow, <laughs> and we have this. I was like, this is this is a sign. And I didn't have my camera on me, which is <laughs> terrible, <laughs> <laughs> typical. Um, but like when you're shooting waves, like in the Siren series, like what are you really looking for? Like, is there any anything you're you're really looking out for? Yeah, I um I want cool shapes. Um, I've got pictures. I've got other portfolios where I've got traditional kind of rolling waves, mm-hmm. but um, I mean everybody does those. You know, I follow I follow a few of the obvious names from Australia, for example. Um, people like Warren Keelan who mm-hmm. do the most gorgeous work. They get in the sea and they capture the wave as it breaks over them. Um, that's so th- I'll leave that mostly to them uh, because they've they've got it sewn up really um but I'm more interested in yeah. in the really stormy waves and I want them to make really interesting shapes so um yeah I don't want a classic graceful breaker I want mm. something really gnarly so I'm looking for two waves crashing into each other that's the key to lovely. it lovely okay yeah. a bit a bit of, a bit of anger yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes yeah. they look surprisingly graceful. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, even though they've crashed together, I've, I've, you know, I've got a few where they don't look angry, but you still have that sort of knowledge that that would not, you'd not be going in, you know, even Warren, who is no doubt an extremely good swimmer, 
I'm sure even Warren wouldn't have gone in the sea with those no, waves. I don't think <laughs> yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> your, um, your, I think it's your Poseidon rising image. Um, the, that's that's what I think. No, it's so elegant. Like that's one of the ones that I think where it looks quite graceful. You know, um, it's 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 absolutely stunning. And when you mentioned that two waves crashing together, I imagine your years and years of actually watching the ocean and watching how waves interact and how tides work that helped you like that's all that's experience like and you kind of knew where to look and where to position yourself for these these scenes I definitely think so I mean it's not something that I'm conscious I'm doing really you know what it's like you know it kind of goes on in your subconscious but I mean you know being a, a poorly sailor you, you can't sort of go down and read a book or something when you're on a sea crossing. You have to stay up if any, as you know, Sean, because you've yeah, suffered right. as well. Yeah. You have to stay up in that's the air. Idea. And yeah. um, yes, absolutely. And, you know, we, we used to do quite long sea crossings. You know, we'd be at sea for hours with nothing, no land in sight. Um, so there's nothing to look at except the sea, really. Mm. Um, and, you know, I spent a lot of time just imagining things you know you know kids are like you know making up stories and imagining things looking at looking at the the waves and the shapes you know sometimes they look like like you like uh, mountains Sean and sometimes they look like mountain scapes don't they and you can sort of almost imagine you can see valleys and passes and all that cool stuff so yeah you you were already talking about that today weren't you that you had an experience like that yeah I kind of wanted to things that drew me to sirens was a trip to the Aran Islands uh, on the west of Ireland a few years ago and I remember when we left Toulon uh, I was standing inside the cabin of the ferry and then once we hit open water next thing I knew I was lying on the ceiling of the ferry because the waves were so rough that we all got <laughs> launched into the ceiling but um, I wouldn't normally be one now to get seasick or whatever but I thought it best and safer to stand on the deck and staring out across the sea and the waves rolling in i've always been very imaginative um i actually i was quite into like video games like age of mythology uh growing up so that's the kind of thing i was picturing like with the crashing waves and your siren series then with the mythology is like exactly that it was like i was looking into the mountains of this i don't know a mount olympus style canyon or like the river sticks going through Erebus and um, with the canyons either side. It was just mad, but the, the waveforms changed so much. And I like oh. it was literally like look your work just embodies that moment so well. Like mm. Well that's really um lovely to hear you say that because that's definitely what I'm shooting for really. Um so I I'm often described as a landscape photographer, but I'm not sure I really fit into that category very well because um I mean, I love landscape photography and follow lots of great landscape photographers and absolutely admire what they do. But essentially what they're doing is that they're going out and, and capturing the landscape. Um, you know, they're usually pretty recognizable faces um, mm-hmm. and you know they, they get them in you know, fabulous light and it's all beautifully composed and they've had to hike a long way. And But it is essentially about place. Whereas I think when you just photograph waves and, you know, I don't often have landmarks. I mean, there's certainly no landmarks in my sirens pictures. It's just the sea and a little bit of sky. Then it becomes a, to completely universal. It's not yes. about place at all. It could be anywhere in the world. And, and indeed, my, my biggest market by far for prints is America. And yet none of the waves were photographed in America. They're not American waves. Yeah. Um, so I, I, that's partly why... I think, although I didn't sort of logically think it through, but I, I think sort of rationalizing it backwards now, I think yeah. that's why I was drawn to the idea of connecting it with myths, because they suggest mm. something a bit more universal mm. um, rather than being about specific places. And also, you've kind of answered my next question, Rachel, because I was going to ask that about like um, a lot of your images, it's not recognizable where they were shot. And Mm. that almost lends itself to this fine art kind of photography and also like and and you touched on landscape photography there and so true like a lot of landscape photographers in Ireland including myself were drawn to the iconic locations do you know what I mean Mm. and immediately when you see a photograph of an iconic location in Ireland you kind of have this bias in your head that like if you see a photo of Dingle you're kind of like okay immediately that's going to be a nice photograph because you think it's Dingle. Mm. Whereas when you can, if you shoot an image that's not recognizable in any location, 
you start to think about the story behind the image because the location has been removed from it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, and that's, and that's definitely what I want. Yeah, I really like that idea. That's what you were going for, like, and even even in your in your oceans and your coasts portfolio, I think it's called on your webs, your oceans, your coasts. Yeah, the, I really admire your your use of um, of shutter speed in one of your photographs. It's it's actually my favorite shot of yours. It's, it's the fire within. Do you oh yeah, that image? yes. It's I do. almost like this tiny wave is being chased in <laughs> by this apocalyptic <laughs> storm coming in from the ocean. Yeah. It's a phenomenal <laughs> image. Um, and again, I think your use of shutter speed there for one, it creates kind of the ethereal calming effect in in your front of your image, and behind it, then you have this sky that's just bearing down. Um, do you find skies are very important when you can't, you don't, you're not shooting a very iconic location? So now you have to try and make a kind of an impactful image. Is is sky like aside from your science portfolio? Now I'm talking about your coastal work. Mm. Would you try and incorporate the sky a lot, and um, to try and uh, make the image more impactful? Um, I used to, yeah. very much so. In fact, um, yeah, maybe eight, eight, ten years ago, I think I was very much a three quarter sky kind of person. Mm. Um, I'm definitely becoming less and less that way. I mean, you've just mentioned one. Uh, one of the pictures that's an exception to that. Yeah. And there's a couple of others on my website that are, are about the sky. But more and more often now, um, I'm putting the horizon above centre. Yeah. Um, so the sky occupies the smaller part of the frame. Um, and I think it's simply because the thing that motivates me to make photographs is the sea. So it just feels natural to me to give it more space mm. than the sky. So most of the time, there are exceptions, but most of the time the sky is the sort of um, a stage for the wave rather than the yes. other way around. Yes. Yeah, yep. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one image again point, point, uh, springs to mind. It's, I think you call it trail, and it's where the white trail of the wave is going through the sand. Uh, I think that's a good example where I think you probably only have a tiny bit of sky in, in, in that image. Actually, you know I'm, can I embarrass you now? Because <laughs> you've just mentioned a photograph that is one of the very few photographs on my website uh, where the horizon's in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were just talking about this last night. So we were about composition and how we always have to place our horizons. And I used to always put mine smack dead in the centre. like, that's very, that's, that must be wrong. <laughs> it's not wrong. It's yeah, not wrong. There we go. Nicely. Whatever the picture, whatever <laughs> looks balanced in the picture. I mean, I, I've hardly got any photos where I use the rule of thirds. Yeah. I practically never use the rule of thirds. I, that's so last year. We recorded a whole podcast last night in composition and we were talking about rule of thirds and so on. Oh, I'm but, sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> no, it's okay because it's, it's one of the key points is mm. rules are there to be broken. You know, they're, mm. they're, it's a guide yeah. for some people. That's all. And if it fits, as you said, if the, whatever balances the image, and if it lends yeah. itself well to the image, then go for it. We'll, yeah, we're, exactly. we're just going to we're just gonna have to scrap that podcast, though. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. Well, I, did, you, did you talk about the golden ratio? A small no. bit, yeah, Fibonacci. Oh, Fibonacci. no, Fibonacci. Not Fibonacci. Not Fibonacci. The golden ratio. <laughs> I mentioned <laughs> it before the episode as well. You you you're going to have to... No, I'm sorry, that, that <laughs> podcast has to go. It's in the bin. <laughs> that one's gone. I'm just going to cut that bit out. It hasn't gone live right yet. <laughs> <laughs> you might just... It'd be easier just to cut this bit out of this one, I think. Uh, this no is way. This, this is a golden. A bit of fun. Uh, oh, Rachel, you keep going. You give us notes. I've got my notebook here now. <laughs> That's Give us a few podcast love. ideas. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. Oh. <laughs> I've silenced you now. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm actually waiting for Ronan to ask, to ask the next question. <laughs> I, I suppose it's actually, it's a really good segue because it did, like we discussed it last night on the podcast, we were writing, um, about the rules of photography. But quite often, as you have shown for your work, Rachel, like the rules don't really apply. So some people will be like adamant that you plan to shoot a location. Others will be adamant you plan by the weather. And um, look for you, that might not necessarily be a big thing because, as you say, you don't incorporate any iconic landmarks. So what would be the process for you choosing your location? Does it come down to like the tide levels, the weather, the forecast or is is it just kind of somewhere you feel you have an affinity with? 
Well, I've got、um, a sort of set of favourite go-to places that I can get to quite easily. I mean, obviously, I don't live out on the coast, but it's only about an hour and a half drive, so I I think that's all right. Except for at the moment, that's all right.、Um, and I've got so I've got a handful of places. And actually, living I live in the、um, inside the M25, so I live really in the almost in the Greater London area.、Um, I actually have access to more variety of beaches than I think if I lived on the coast because it's like the hub of a wheel. I've got spokes、oh, going、yeah. out to different places,、um, and yeah, yeah. I will choose where to go based on、um, a combination of the forecast. But that's definitely the smallest bit, and the tide, which is much bigger because the tide is far more predictable for starters. So I mean, I did、um, in that we had a brief. Break here between、um, well, in for about two or three weeks in December before Christmas, we were out of lockdown, and I was able to run my workshops again. And I had three dawn to dusk workshops on the coast on a Thursday, Friday, and then the following Monday. And the forecast was just hideous for all three, and we had completely spectacular, gorgeous light for all three. Oh, um, so、no、the forecast, way, <laughs> yeah, it was great.、But、I was so because I don't use, I don't bring my camera when I'm leading.、Um, so I must admit, I was <laughs> a bit frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> but I was really glad for my clients. But no, I wasn't、yeah. trying to advertise my work so much. I, genuinely, that that is relevant because、um, the point is, the forecast is really unreliable, especially at the coast.、Mm. You know, I'm、so、often standing on the coast, looking out to sea, thinking, "Whoa, that's not what they forecast." But over the land behind me is exactly what they forecast. Yes. So、um, yeah, it's the tide.、Sense. The tide is more than anything. So I've got certain places that I really like going to for super big low tide, spring tide.、Um, at the bottom of the tide, I've got other places I look for a high tide.、Um, so the tide really directs where I'm going, and then. I kind of ignore the forecast mostly,、um, and if I go down there and it's plain blue sky and light, you know, lots of sunlight and not what I would normally like,、um, then I'll I'll wait until the golden hour, and then that's the perfect light for doing details on the shore.、Mm. Yeah, you yeah, know, I, I love、yeah. that. I mean, a really low angle glancing light, golden light, just. Coming right across the sand and just picking up the rim of a shell or of the foam as it rushes around a shell. So there's, I think, being flexible means that I never feel disappointed, no matter what the weather turns out to be, because there's always something that I can find to do that suits the conditions that have have shown up. That makes a lot of sense. If that、That's, makes sense, that makes total <laughs> sense. It absolutely yeah, does. Yeah, I suppose it's really、yeah. nice that you that you have that mo- you know that that in your head that you know whatever the weather, you're not going to be disappointed. You're going to either get something or you'll just get the experience of being by the ocean, which you're going to enjoy、yeah. anyway. So, it is. It's beautiful, Rachel. What gear do you shoot with? I mean, we're we're all、uh, Nikon shooters here, so we're always curious to see what <laughs> what other people shoot with. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm surprised you're letting me on the show then. Oh, oh <laughs> you're going to say, you say the c word. <laughs> I am. I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's okay.、Oh, are you、we'll、our first guest? Is, is Rachel our first guest? Kind of- Yes, no, Peter.、Oh. Peter Hurley was canon as well, and、um, oh, Peter. It was、Lucy. lovely chatting to you, Rachel. Thank you for addressing me. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. We'll allow it just for tonight. Oh, thank you. You're kind. <laughs> You're very、um, welcome. Yeah, I use. I've always used、um, since my my very first SLR, which was before SLRs had a D in front of them, was、um, a Canon, and I've stuck with them ever since.、Um, but I do also have. Um, some Fuji gear as well. Ah, lovely. That, We can talk about the、yeah. Fuji stuff. So, no, <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, what's it, what's in your bag? What's in your go-to bag when you're heading down to the, the、um, sea? So, the the core kit is、uh, one of my、um, Canon DSLRs. I've got two five DSLRs, so I'll take one of those, and、um, I will take my sixteen to thirty five, my twenty four to seventy, and. Either my seventy to two hundred or my one hundred four hundred, and、mm. my. Am I allowed to mention other brands of other things?、Uh, you can、uh, mention whatever you want. Right, Lee, 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 Lee filters. <laughs> I、uh, I use Lee filters, and I always have done.、Um, mm. So I am now. I must declare, 
in all fairness that I am a uh, leaf filters master, but um, I was using Brilliant. their filters for years well before deserved. they asked me to be a leaf filters master. So yeah. it's not like I've been sort of paid to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I was genuinely right. using Rachel, their you, stuff. You, going nuts. <laughs> yeah. you can okay. say whatever you want. It's okay. <laughs> okay. There's, no, there's, there's no rules here, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no whole part. Le- 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 and uh, that, that's about it, really. Um, obviously, I have a tripod and I'm not yeah. wedded to any particular brand. But what I like is I like a, a heavy sturdy tripod because one of the nice things about being a coastal photographer is we don't have to do a lot of climbing of mountains yes so it doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be light in fact it absolutely needs to be not light because it spends most of its time standing in the sea that's what i was going to yeah. ask have you any tips for um because i've often found about the coast and my tripod when i'm trying to shoot receding waves it pulls the tripod out and your image is blurry. Have you any tips for trying to keep your tripod fairly solid apart from having a kind of a relatively heavy tripod? Do you, yeah, so do definitely, you really embed it down? Yeah, definitely. Um, push it right down as hard as you can go. Mm. Um, and you can always get it out again unless it's sort of thick clay, which we don't really have on our coast. But I better mm. just leave that except in there just in case one of your <laughs> listeners <laughs> says told me to ram my tripod as far as I could into the sand. <laughs> I'm suing her. <laughs> You'll go on um, to the west coast of yes. Ireland and just see a line of tripod stuck in the sand. Oh no, that'd be awful. <laughs> but uh, yeah, push it, push it down as, as far as you possibly can in, into the sand or the shingle. Um, is, it always works for me. Um, I've got some clients who use spikes on their tripods. I I, yeah. I have spikes, but I don't tend to. I find mm. that the, the rubber feet are fine. You just push it right down, and um, and it and it works. Yeah, yeah. I you know I do use spikes because um, a lot of the time where I'm shooting, it's quite windy. Um, yeah. So it's just the spikes just help to anchor it a bit more, and like I'd have to have to anchor, hang my camera bag off to even off the tripod just try and give it a bit of weight but that's because I'm using a carbon fibre tripod and because yeah. obviously for hiking and stuff you need to try and shed as many ki- kilos as you can to try and make it a bit easier yeah you know? there's a different equation for you for sure um, mm. so I'm, I don't use carbon fibre tripods I'm using you know good old chunky metal yeah. metal legs and I don't buy expensive ones because um, you know I could spend 800 quids on a famous Italian set of tripod legs and they won't last any longer than my 150 quid yeah. uh, ones because the salt water the doesn't doesn't actually read yeah. it doesn't read the brand name <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on the legs of the tripod and it has it has at, at it just as much so <laughs> you must actually you, you must go through a lot of tripods just thinking no because yeah. salt water really corrodes like you know so oh yeah you must have buried a lot and of tripods sand in. getting inside like does it get yeah. all you know Squishy. Yeah, that's not so much of a problem because um, I use the. I definitely will only use the screw locks for okay. the legs. Uh, the levers are a Lovely. nightmare. Yeah. Um, because yeah. they corrode and they gum up and then they snap. But the mm-hmm. yep. screws ones are so easy to take apart and clean. They're just yes. an old toothbrush and Perfect. you know you're done. Yeah, it's definitely essential. 100%. Mm. We love it when our guests speak about their tripods because it gives us loads of clips we can take out of context. <laughs> this tripod is oh no! <laughs> I'm really just worried ran, about what I just the said tripod about into the ground. <laughs> I know, about you taking an old toothbrush to it. That's a bit weird. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> wait till you hear the highlight reel oh the highlight reel is going to be great um, no, we'll, we'll segue away from that <laughs> um, Rachel you print a lot of your work and you publish some books as well so like, what would be your, your workflow I suppose to take your image from location shoot post process and then out to print and publish um, do you do any like self publishing or do you use companies or labs or what way does it work well, um, with the books, I haven't self-published yet. I've had three books and they've all been published by a publisher. Um, that's not to say I never would self-publish. Um, maybe number four will be self-published for the first time. Um, Exclusive. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, we're, t- <laughs> we're taking that as an exclusive, right? Uh, I'm going to take out the word no, maybe. No, it's too soon. I, the, the latest one only just got published three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So I can't Tizen. talk about number four yet. <laughs> how, is, how is your book doing, actually, Rachel? How's, your, how's Tyson's? I don't stuff? know. 
I don't know. <laughs> that's cool. That's, that's the publisher's job. <laughs> nice. Um, but um, with uh, actually being, when you do books, I don't know if you guys have done any books between you, but if, if you are published, you'll never make a great deal of money. Um, it's not about that really. Um, so for me, the, the sort of business end of it actually is the um, selling the limited edition prints for people's walls. And that is yep. um, definitely the, the bulk of my business income. Um, and so, That's yes, I do print, um, but I only have an A2 printer. Okay. So um, I don't really, well, I, I kind of do have room, but I would have to reorganize quite a lot to fit a big one in. And I just don't know if it would be worth my while. Um, yeah. So ev- every picture that I decide is going to be released to the world even if it's just uh, Instagram, I will print it first and print it at least A3 and, and stick it on the wall, which you've probably heard me witter on about in Sean's um, yeah. lovely video. Yeah. I found this really and, interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can probably see some behind me that have been sitting sitting there. So they're not yeah. very glamorous. They're just up with blue tack and they're sort of all over the place. Um, but, you know, I sort of come and go in my studio every day and I'm living with those prints and you do notice some stuff when, when you've sort of got that objectivity. I think, you know, if it's, mm. if you, you, if you, if I do it all of a rush, I'm probably going to regret publishing the picture, but this is kind of stopping me from making that mistake. I'm not saying I never publish a picture I regret because I'm only human, but yeah. um, I try not to. And um, anyway, eventually, when I've decided, yes, I really do like this print, well, then it's easy to work with a third-party printer if I need larger prints because, you know, I just send them a print-ready file and there's no guesswork because I've printed it at A2 at home and they always look exactly as they should. So Mm -hmm. it works. Um, And um, because of customs duty issues, which, of course, for this country just got a whole lot worse probably, although I gather we have Mm -hmm. a deal. Bully. No, I'm not going to get into that. You can <laughs> yeah, probably guess not. what I think of it. Sorry, guys, I'm ashamed. But anyway, uh, <laughs> moving moving swiftly away from the politics, I've just alienated 50% of my retired client base. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not caught in that with old iteration. No, don't. It's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm proud of it. <laughs> um, so you should be. Yes, quite. Anyway, um, being an outward looking person, not insular. Um, but anyway, Anyway, when um, Glass half I, fallen, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, someone in America, let's say, let's take it away from that particularly controversial arena over here. If someone in America wants to buy one of my prints, I actually get it printed in America. Okay. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. You know, and they get a certificate of authenticity that's signed by me, which they have to keep with the print. Um, and so it still counts to the limited edition, and there's no import duty. Yeah. Which really brilliant. helps because it's just not a good look when you uh, send a print to a client and then it gets held up in customs and they've got to pay to get it released. Mm-hmm. And there's absolutely yeah. no way to to guard against it from this end. So, And if, God forbid, there was ever like if it got damaged in the post or delivery or anything then and you're trying to get it sent back and you're going to it, it can be, yeah, it, it can be a nightmare. Like, yeah, so yeah, that's that, that's a very smart, that's a very smart workflow. And obviously you've built up a relationship with printers in, in the States and um, they, they're your go-to printers now for that. Yeah, so I just use one. It's the gallery that represents me also do, um, you know, uh, top quality printing. I'm trying not to use the term fine art because I don't really like it very much. So yeah. uh, top, top quality printers <laughs> and, yeah. um, and they also represent me. So it's quite nice to have it all under one, one roof, really. What's their name, Rachel? They're called the Sohn Gallery, S-O-H-N. It's the name of the owner, Cassandra Sohn. It's the Sohn <coughs> Fine Art <laughs> <laughs> Gallery. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's in Massachusetts. Ah, oh, lovely. I, I seem to be on a bit of um, a bit wrong. of a heading here, and mm-hmm. I was just wondering, Rachel, what was your thoughts on the U.S. election? 
No, anyways. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> I was like, uh, I, think, I, think, I think we're on fairly solid ground over here, aren't we? I mean, pretty well anyone who isn't American doesn't understand yeah. <laughs> why, why, why it isn't a good result. So <laughs> I'm probably going to have the CIA coming up to me now. Uh. Sorry, they do worry. listen to the podcast frequently in fairness Rachel yeah. <laughs> they're, they're big, big, fans, <laughs> big fans of the Troy pod um, Rachel Barr um, investigation by the CIA what's next for uh, for Rachel <laughs> Talibat in, um, in 2021 have you any plan I know obviously you COVID and the lockdown it's not easy to obviously um, your, your workshops cannot uh, go ahead no, at the moment no it's just very difficult yeah um have you any had you any plans coming up or um well it it's very hard to know isn't it um yeah. i was looking at that you know if you'd asked me three months ago i'd have been saying this year is going to be all about workshops because i have all of last year's workshops postponed to this year mm. with all of this year's that I had already sold so i was going to be doing two years worth of workshops in one year which was sort of daunting and then at the same time kind of cool and bring it on I was thinking um who knows now but it assuming things get better in the second quarter and I you know glass half full yeah. the only way to get through isn't it love it absolutely, um, absolutely. yes I've Definitely. got uh I've, I've got well I've got a, a workshop in Brittany in March which I'm not sure about that will happen wow. or not we'll see that's it but then beautiful. I've got two workshops in Iceland I've got a workshop in um in America, I've got a workshop in Portugal. I've got, and then I've got Antarctica with um, Sean and Thomas That's Heaton right. and Erin well, yeah. Babnick and all no that way. lot. Yeah. So, um, and also my husband and I were hoping to do some exploring of Patagonia on our, on the way down to Antarctica. Fantastic. So. I want wow. to do lots of cool stuff. Just yeah. hope, that hope I can. Uh, yeah, I, just for you, I want COVID just to go away. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, I did like, notice there was, a, there was a glaring omission there in your lack of Irish workshops, but I'm sure that will happen. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm actually, this summer just gone, I was going to be doing a road trip in Ireland with my daughter. I have a um, teenage, well, she's 20 now. She was 20 last month, daughter. And we get on really well and we were just going to share the driving and just drive around for days and days and days and see oh. as much as we could and just soak it all up. Um, yeah. But uh, obviously that's just another thing to plan plan for yep. the future. Absolutely. Does your daughter do have any interest in photography? Road trip. Only a sort of Instagram selfie kind. <laughs> 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 but she's, she's, um, she is a, a creative. She's um, studying um, composing for visual media at Berkeley College Amazing. in Boston. So Brilliant. she's, she's no musical. Yeah. Very That's good. why I do concerts. I'm a failed musician. So I can, ah, if I can't okay. get on stage, I get as close to it as possible. That was my logic. Ah, anyway. yeah. <laughs> well, she, I mean, she really is, is hoping to be behind stage as well, but she, to write the music um, rather yeah. than, rather than being front of stage. She doesn't have any yeah. interest in being famous. <laughs> oh, well, that's Sensible all I want girl. in life. <laughs> <laughs> that's all, that's all I crave on a daily basis. Like, that's all I want. <laughs> that's that's why that you've got the red headphones, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And the green t-shirt. <laughs> yep. He wishes. <laughs> Rachel, you know me so well, and we're only here like forty-five minutes. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> oh god. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, I can't remember what I was going to say now, Rachel. I'm uh, just being too silly. <laughs> you no, know, that's all good. This is oh, this is the way it is. As we said, our podcast is very unscripted. We like to we like to just we like to just chat. Um, I was going to ask about your teaching experience, and do you find it helps you in your workshops when you're dealing with um when you're dealing with your clients and kind of interacting? Oh, yeah. it, it must like um, you you obviously enjoy the teaching aspect. Yeah, and if you can teach a room full of litigators, city litigators, you know. This is easy. Photographers are pretty cats yeah. by comparison. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a fair point, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I don't know. Um, do you do workshops, Sean? No, I don't. No, I do not. Okay. Um, no, I it's bet you've that, got mates something. who do, though. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I do. Um, they no, you do. Sean, 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 in the those workshops. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's not that hard, really. It's, it's, I shouldn't say that, but the point is that you, that you share a passion with your clients' photography, mm. and I just think that breaks the ice straight away. And you know, everyone's there because they love photography as much as I do, which 
means that even though I haven't got my camera with me, I have a brilliant day just That's hanging out with, you know, getting inspired by other people's enthusiasm for photography. It's That's I such a good it. point, yeah, because like, I, I 100% wish... 100% like, agree with that. I mean, I even there's days my... where you bump into a photographer when you're out and about and all of a sudden, you know, your moods improve because you're talking about something you're passionate about and something you love with someone else. You know, like like-minded people will always make any kind of moment better, so... Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So and then also, you know, there, it's very rewarding if, if your client has a light bulb moment. You know, and I love that. Yeah. That's one of the yeah, greatest, yeah, is, yeah. greatest joys when, you know, suddenly, you know, I've, I've, I have actually, I shouldn't say this because it starts to make me sound like I might be really scary, but I have one or two of my clients have been known to burst into tears. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's not because... <laughs> It's not because I'm beating them up, um, <laughs> but it's because they've just suddenly seen something in a different way or they've used bulb for the first time or mm. they've suddenly discovered that they actually really can make better pictures if they stand in the sea. And, you know, yeah. it can be for any reason, but it just shows how how magical photography is and mm. how um, being creatively fulfilled is so important for for us all, isn't it, for our mental health absolutely absolutely fulfilling your own passions and it just photography instills something in i think every photographer they probably find it hard to put into words but you know what it is you know it just it's that's it's, yeah. that, it's what motivates you what drives you and what lights that fire like and that must be an amazing moment when one of your clients just has that epiphany almost and they're just like you you see the joy that's after bringing to their to them yeah. and that small moment like that must be fantastic it is i absolutely love it Absolutely. That was fantastic. And it's, yeah. it's so true that they're all, all your clients, they are all have a passion for photography. All, you're all like minded. Like, I wish I could say that about all my students in the classroom today. I want to be here. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> probably 70% of them don't die didn't when I was in school. So <laughs> they probably don't die either, you know? Um, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Ron, and you probably, you can probably relate to that for in your workshops. Definitely. It's, it's one of the best things out of doing workshops is that like the light bulb moment. It's, like even like Rachel says, when you don't bring your camera, it's to get that kind of, it's like you've gone back and learned it yourself again, I suppose, mm. in a way, like you, you relive that eureka moment. But there's one thing I'm really curious about, Rachel, um, coming from the background with the, the law, but then also being a mother, um, having to raise your kids, going into this career in 2015, and then like a yearish later suddenly sirens takes off what was it like with that initial wave excuse the pun in fairness I, I, I'm surprised it's taken so long so yeah. no, I, I mean I'm yeah. amazed no one's ever said that to me before yes <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> on the crest of the wave <laughs> what was it I, I'm seething I didn't think for myself oh good grace <laughs> the next 10 just, minutes are just going to be puns galore <laughs> Oh, no. I'm not even going to join in. I'll just leave the floor to you guys. Um, but yes, this, this is what um, I have to deal with, Rachel. It's honestly oh. like these lads always just go off. They hear one pun and then they're set off. Oh, we're done. Well, basically, no, like, to summarise the question, um, how was it like so early in your career just absorbing all of that? Like I'd say your social media was erupting, your emails, inquiries. Like even us, when we first set up this podcast, I remember texting in the group like, who would you like to hear on the podcast and literally the first name that came through was Rachel Talibart it was like oh, wow. boom <laughs> yeah. so I All think right, we said can the I same swear again? Peter Hurley <laughs> now so yeah, you can swear as much as you want Rachel you can swear all you want yeah we do I'll just enough. be honest I'll just be honest it was it was bloody brilliant <laughs> yeah lovely Rachel yeah. that's not a bad swear okay <laughs> <laughs> trust yeah, me I thought you were going to come up with something <laughs> that worse <there. laughs> oh, no I mean you know it was it's fantastic Oh, mm. a dream come true. Absolutely brilliant. And um, I, the, the first big storm when I really got sirens going, Storm Imogen, which was, um, see, I'm so sad. I know the date. It was the 8th of <laughs> February, 2016. Um, and do you know what? I reckon I was literally on some sort of weird high from that for at least a year mm. afterwards. And Amazing. I only had to hear the music that I was listening to in the car on my way to and from the beach that day to get completely excited again you know feel an absolute you know a literal sort of visceral adrenaline rush of excitement um that was ab absolutely fantastic and um I, would, I know i could say and it's not it's not a lie to say that even if it hadn't had the reception it had had i'd still be 
proud of and exhilarated by the work, I would. But I can't well, pretend. I can't no. pretend that it wasn't absolutely fantastic to have other people like it too so much because, I mean, we're all human. We, everyone likes it when people like their stuff. Hundred percent, exactly. Absolutely, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's like a, a, a singer songwriter. Um, they they don't write songs and not not play them to the world. You know no. what I mean? Like we don't create images and not try and get them, get them out there and get get them seen by yeah. people. I mean, Sirens has been critically acclaimed, like so. It's it's it's, it's known worldwide and and for very good reason. And it's 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 so true. Like you said, Derry, when you listen, when you hear the music that you heard in the car, and it it obviously transports you back to to that day. Um, oh yeah. Just a gear question. You you shot Sirens predominantly with your seventy to two hundred, didn't you? Yes. In fact, I think. Uh, I think every single one of them is with that lens. Yeah. Really? How uh, how dangerously close were you to, to the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> um, not as not as dangerously close as you might think. Um, yeah. Because of the shape of that beach, um, and it was high tide as well. So it's not like you, if you imagine if you've tried to shoot waves on a, a sandy beach with a, a you know shallow fall. Yeah, waves are way, way out to sea. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But this beach is very steeply shelved. Okay, so you can be like one step up from where the waves are breaking and oh, be fairly safe. Um, it gets deep quite that, quick. Yeah, yeah, it does really. I mean, the, the downside, of course, is that if you do get it wrong, you're in deep trouble. Yeah, way more trouble yeah. than you would be if you're on a shallow, shelving, sandy beach. Um, mm. And mm. there's no mercy. It's, it's hard shingle and a hard sea wall. And of course, yep. you know, to bring the mood down briefly, there have been fatalities at that really? beach. Um, yeah. But to be honest, most of the time when I go uh, now, these days, I don't go so often because it's quite crowded on a stormy yeah. day. Um, but when I do go down there, there's lots of photographers, the serious ones with the 70 to 200 uh being quite sensible, frankly. I don't see any stupidity from them. The crazy Good. stuff is from people with their, their iPhone, the phones, because they haven't got a zoom lens. Oh, no. And they have to get close. Yeah. And I've seen the, I've seen some yeah. mad, mad things there. Yeah. We've but all you can't seen say it. anything, because they no. won't thank you. They won't thank you, no. Uh, and you won't get like you, you, you know, are just, for just looking out for them, you know. Yeah. Rachel, yeah. I need to ask, what was the song? Because the musician in me, it's just like I've been itching to find out. Because <laughs> I'm just sitting here just going like, I need to know what song this is. You, won't, you, won't, you won't know it because it's weird, okay? I'm uh, not going to like I it. I know a lot of weird music. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a song called Aquary by Crywolf, who is uh, an um, American, um, do you know him? I know Croy Wolf. I don't know that song though. Okay, so, um, so it's literally named after the city in Northern Iceland, Aquary, which I'm probably pronouncing badly. And um, it's from a whole album that he did, which is called. Oh, it'll come back to me. I've forgotten the name of the album now. But it it he basically went and did a kind of retreat to Iceland, and stayed in a remote, rented sort of house on the east of Iceland. Um, this is several years ago, um, when the East was still really quite one of you know, pretty sparsely populated. Mm. And he did a load of videos about his sort of creative process while he was there. And they're quite interesting because he's quite a young guy. You can see him just slowly losing his mind <laughs> through the isolation, <laughs> the isolation and everything. And he had these, uh, some quite, quite, um, freaky music, um, but Aquary is the most commercial of the songs uh, on there. It's, and it, it just, I don't know, it's, it expresses a sense of joy and wonder mm. about nature. It's very me, apt. Anyway. Very apt. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant. There you go now, Kev. I'm going to look, look I, up that I, I needed to know that. Like, I wouldn't have slept tonight if I didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, owe, I owe all my uh, you know, non-mum kind of music to my daughter's influence. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Otherwise, it would just be Coldplay all the time. <laughs> Not wrong, wrong with Coldplay. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's, that's absolutely right. <laughs> the adventure of a lifetime. Yeah. 
Rachel. <laughs> paradise, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an absolutely fantastic chat. Um, before we finish up, okay, we have a quick fire round that we do with all our guests. Okay. And, um, right. It's a quick fire round that often doesn't isn't quick because I go down rabbit holes and we all do. Okay, so we'll if we we'll try and make it as quick as possible. <laughs> all right, it's just serious okay. questions. Um, bit of fun. So our first one, Rachel, raw or JPEG? Raw. Perfect. Boom. Question yeah. one. There's, done. there's no arguments Lovely. there. I don't no. know why. We, we, we always say we take that one out. But you know what? Someday someone <laughs> might say JPEG and we'll just hit cancel. And <laughs> and and yeah. You'll yeah. kick them off the Hell. podcast. Well, if, you, if, you, <laughs> if you interview a paparazzi, they're going to say JPEG. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They probably will say, say JPEG. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, okay, yeah, no. Never. I was going to say a concept photographer, but no, you, you know, you're know, shooting raw. Do you want to, if you want to get it out oh, really yeah. quick, like. I'm mm. still shooting raw. Still yeah, yeah. would never uh, even imagine it. Yeah. Okay. So, the question to do: If you could bring only one camera accessory with you when you're out shooting, what would it be? Well, what am I allowed to have apart from the accessory? Because it's not going to be just, much just use if camera. I have got. Okay, just the camera. Oh no! And as in, like, yeah, you're bringing. So, it's just, you're bringing all your camera gear, and then what accessory would you bring with you if you had to bring one? This accessory? podcast counts as an accessory if you want to bring us and listen to us. Be like, yeah, <laughs> oh, okay. Like okay. All right, that's tripod. obviously it. The tripod <laughs> fod, uh, podcast is okay. the only accessory that any photographer will ever need. Jeez, ever. That's the best answer we've ever <laughs> the heard. Sound clip. Clip. <laughs> <laughs> clip that. Can we actually? Can we? Can we quote you on that? Like <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> Instagram real. Can that go on T-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be our merchandise. <laughs> so I don't know what's an accessory is really. I mean, I so, I would just bring the bare minimum, basically. Um, but then what I might consider, a, you know, so I don't know, a filter, I guess. A three oh, stock yeah. ND, oh, three stop ND. There we go. Yeah. Lee yeah. filter. Yeah. From yeah. Lee you filters, can, you can yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Nice. Clarity, Rachel, yes or no? A tiny bit sometimes if I'm in the mood. Mm. Yeah. What's wrong with a bit yeah. of clarity? Yeah. Although apparently it's very old fashioned now. Really? Yes. T- texture is <laughs> where it's told. at now. Ooh. <laughs> Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't hear that. No, we didn't get. We didn't get that memo over here. <laughs> Maybe that's what we're doing wrong. <laughs> Hasn't reached yeah, us yet. That's to be all. A judicious use of texture and dehaze now, apparently. Okay, right. Oh, yes. <laughs> God, I, I should have taken notes for this podcast. <laughs> um, it's okay, I Sean. Have I have Sean, a recording somewhere. <laughs> 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 yeah, and nearly everyone we've had on are kind of like, yeah, a bit of clarity, Just not too touch. much. It can do a bit. Is you know, don't go overboard with it. So um, yeah. yeah, that's a very fair answer sometimes i drop clarity just right, yeah drop yeah. it down like yeah 10, 15. create yeah. that soft look that can work beautiful. can work beautifully mm. yeah i often do that yeah, with light if there's some strong source of light a bit of radi- radial filter reduce clarity makes it a bit softer yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah absolutely um question four one lens that you could only shoot with for the rest of your life so you pick one lens rachel what 70 would it be? 200. 70 to 100, yeah. Yes. I thought yes. that would have been your answer. I thought yeah. you were going to go 24 to 70. I did. Uh, was... It's borderline. It's borderline. Mm, I was going to say no, it. No, 70 to 200. Either that nice. or a 100 megapixel sensor so I can crop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. <laughs> That's a very clever answer. Yeah. <laughs> That is a very clever answer. Um, a lot like, also something we spoke about yesterday as well. By the way, yeah, the, the cropping. cropping. That cropping, episode's so. gone, lads. Yeah, that yeah. episode's gone. Nothing, nothing yeah. wrong <laughs> with cropping. <laughs> no, there is nothing wrong with perfect. cropping. It can often save an image. We were talking about this last night. It can often save an image for you. It can often make make an image that possibly wasn't too good into a keeper like especially mm. when you don't have time, that much time to compose. Like Ronan was speaking about weddings and stuff when it's obviously quite frantic when you're trying to shoot and often yeah. you don't have time to compose perfectly do you know what I mean so a crop can save an image like same right, gig uh, definitely if you, if you same, same with wildlife sports mm. and waves yeah. which is a lot more like wildlife and sports than it is landscapes yeah that's yeah, so true very true it's very, very, very true mm. yeah because it's like split second changing constantly mm. whereas generally speaking the landscape will stay where it is uh, mostly well, yeah unless mostly. you unless you yeah. had too much yeah. to drink yeah I was going to say Kim okay, generally the landscape does stay where, where it's meant <laughs> to stay yeah, it doesn't it <laughs> the mountains whatever, don't like change place yeah. overnight whatever <laughs> <laughs> okay if we really want to go into that yeah okay, global warming is causing the landscape to move unfortunately exactly. and change is that what you meant Kev is it 
Yeah, of course. What else okay. would I have meant? <laughs> okay. 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 Bigger concerns than your photograph. If that was to happen, like if you're mid landslide, you're not going to be like mm, F eight. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, <slide down here. laughs> oh god! Um, I Rachel, bet you'll still be trying to rescue your camera, though. <laughs> absolutely, of course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if something has to, if something has to be saved, it's the camera. Yeah, yeah. barrier legs, legs or camera. I'm going to save the camera. Um, <laughs> you can take photographs and. No leg, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I'd figure out a way, Kevin. Trust me, I'd figure out a way. Uh, question five, Rachel. Our last question in the quick fire round. If you could choose another camera brand aside from Canon, which one would it be? Oh. And don't worry if you choose the wrong answer. But you have to choose the uh, correct answer. You can't choose Fuji either because you would make oh, a Oh, no, I'm going to be really gonna, controversial. Gonna I'm going to be really uh -oh. controversial. The S word is coming. Apple. Apple. Oh, I love. I've got an. I've, I've got an iPhone 12 Pro Max. It's wow. so cool. It was wow. my Christmas present. They are. No, they the are impressive. Answer. The new camera, yeah. cameras are impressive in the iPhone. Yeah. But you did say it was in addition to my can Canon. I didn't have to give up my Canon. No, you I didn't. obviously wouldn't be giving that up for my phone. But <laughs> it's going to be great for video. At this yeah, phone. definitely. Yeah. 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 Certainly. Have you? Uh, do you shoot? Um, any video, Rich? Is that something that you would Starting like to do? Starting to. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing it more and more, um, but not, I'm not going to become a, uh, a vlogger or anything. Yeah. Um, it's really just because I'm enjoying it. I really mm. like, I do these little, silly little um, snippets on Instagram every now and then in stories of like 10 seconds of video and then it yeah. sort of blends into a still. And I I'm really them. enjoying that. Yeah, it looks really nice. That's it looks just really for fun. Lovely. Video can be very creative. It can be very fun mm. to do. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hundred um, percent. That's our quick fire round. That wasn't. That wasn't too bad. We've had a lot longer quick fire rounds. So <laughs> that's funny. You survived. I didn't. You survived. That's I kind of that's because you asked the question, Sean. Yeah. See, if <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> asking the question, we'd still be here for another half an hour. <laughs> um, Rachel, this has been just absolutely class thank you very much uh, it's, no, been, it's been my pleasure it has been yeah. absolutely beautiful thank it's you very really much fun. Yeah, it's been really fun um, I'm a small bit starstruck just like I, I was I was nervous <laughs> coming on to this oh, podcast stop it. to speak to you <laughs> Um, <laughs> before we like, I'm starstruck every time I talk to these lads as well do you know I have to say that like, you know, oh yeah <laughs> they'll get a no you're anyway. not yeah, no, it's, been, like, it's, it's been it's been lovely and emotional and I think you kind of brought us on a journey with it and it was it was really lovely so thank it you it really was yeah, it's been really, no, really, really nice, enjoyed Rachel. it Thanks it's been lovely on. chatting to all three of you before you go Rachel um, yeah. would you like this is where you get to do a shameless plug of all your <laughs> books your portfolios your social media go for it where do can not, people oh, find okay. you go all mental right. yeah all don't right. worry I, shameless okay I, I, I find this sort of thing makes me cringe but anyway here we go right okay so my main <laughs> social media is, is Instagram and it's just my name so I'm not hard to find there are no other Rachel Talibarts in the world that I'm aware of um, and uh, my website is my name again which is nice and easy Brilliant. and if you fancied buying a book that would be very nice I'm assuming there are some left because I don't actually know but I think so <laughs> yes. and um, you can follow if you go to my Instagram or my website you can find links to it there it's called Tides and Tempests and it's 160 pages so it's a big Ooh, book brilliant. and it's a big book. Uh, what else oh I do work I have a workshops uh, business called F11 workshops as in the aperture F11 mm, workshops yes. and that mm -hmm. is I own that business um, and there you can find it by using F11 workshops and I also lead residential workshops for Ocean Capture and that is a business owned by Jonathan Critchley and if you want to have a really class photographer on your podcast you might think about asking Jonathan yes absolutely. but don't tell him I notebook. said that <laughs> Okay, we're all, we're all we'll absolutely right. have to name drop you. We'll all write down Jonathan's name, please. <laughs> I'm out of I think that's that. that's probably enough. Everyone has switched off now. It's like, oh, well, here she goes. No, <laughs> no, we love it. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Rachel, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Um, we hope that this situation with COVID works out and you get to do all the fantastic plans that you have laid out for 2021. And if you are ever in Ireland, please do. Give us a shout and um, oh, you I will. can show us how it's done on the, on the coast so you can. Absolutely. And we'll we'll yeah, show you some I'd inland stuff as well, maybe. Excellent. In Ireland. <laughs> good. That Rachel, sounds really good. Thanks very much. 
We really thank appreciate you. it, Rachel. It's been a pleasure, thank Rachel. You, thank you very you. much. Bye Thanks then. very Bye much now. for, for listening, Bye. folks. And we will see you next Tuesday. Stay safe. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Tripod. If you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon. And don't forget, folks, we do have all social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And you can join us in our deadly Facebook community group as well. And please leave a review. Reviews help. So leave a review. Yurt.